You're listening to Autumn on the Air, the weekly podcast that brings you conversations about the impact of research commercialization and the people who make it happen. Join us for interviews with patent and licensing professionals, innovators, entrepreneurs, and tech transfer leaders on the issues and trends that matter most. Keep listening for an inside track on the people, IP policies, and politics changing our world. Autumn's annual licensing activity survey polls U.S. and Canadian universities, hospitals, and other research institutions about metrics related to tech transfer. With three decades of collective metrics, the survey provides the definitive benchmark for measuring the impact of academic research innovation. Both the 2022 U.S. and Canadian licensing surveys were just released at the end of July. Today, we're diving into the findings of the Canadian Licensing Survey, and we're joined by Olivia Novak, the chair of the Autumn Canadian Licensing Survey Committee and Associate Director of Technology Transfer at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Olivia leads the team that is responsible for assessment and management of intellectual property generated at McGill, including patent applications, identifying inventions with commercialization potential, developing them, and commercializing them through licensing or spin-off company creation. Olivia has a PhD in undergrad in biochemistry from McGill and an international baccalaureate degree in health sciences from B. Booth College. Olivia has been an Autumn member since 2011 and has been the chair of the Autumn Canadian Licensing Survey Committee as a volunteer since 2017. Welcome, Olivia. I'm so excited to have you here on the air. Thank you for having me. Well, we have a lot to talk about today because we're going to be talking about the Canadian Licensing Survey. So I think right off the bat, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, how did you even get involved with the survey? So in 2016, I started being the one filling the survey for the office here at McGill. So it was my first year. I was looking at the data. I was getting excited. And I noticed that not everyone answers the survey. So basically, uh, when I went to the annual uh, meeting with Autumn, I tried to find the chair of the Canadian survey. So I asked her, what, what's happening? How come like not everyone's answering? Because that's like super important survey. It's, it's all about what we do. I'm surprised, you know, even in my province, Quebec, there's, there's a lot of people that don't answer. So, you know, we had a big conversation. And at the end of it, I told her I, I would really like, you know, uh, to be involved with the survey if you have space uh, as a volunteer. And, you know, she told me that year that she didn't have space, but she called me like a few months later saying, and she offered me the chair position, which was even more exciting because I jumped from, you know, nothing to the chair uh, of, of this autumn survey. And, um, yeah, that's how it started for me. And I felt like, you know, I had the experience, you know, had been in the office for over six years. And at that time in tech transfer, I'd worked in industry in a similar role. So, you know, I had all it take to to do this. And I was very excited. I had a smile on my face for a while because I, I you know, I thought it was a really exciting thing to be part of. Yeah. And you jumped right in, didn't you? You know, went right to the top, which is that's pretty impressive. Yes. So, Olivia, I think many Americans might assume that Canadian tech transfer professionals are just like American tech transfer professionals, but probably a little bit nicer. But seriously, I'm guessing there's much more that makes Canadian tech transfer unique. What are some of the aspects of tech transfer in Canada that are important to keep in mind when we talk about the Canadian licensing survey? So I would say that the main difference is that we don't have something similar to the Baydol Act or similar federal provincial uh, legislation in Canada that governs how IP rights uh, resulting from research subsidized by those funds are ruled, right? So we don't have that. And this means that there is really no obligation to disclose. And the funding agencies, what they require the governments is that we have an IP policy in place at an institution. That's the only requirement. And the result of that is that each institution will have their own rules or their own IP policy. So you'll see in Canada that ownership of IP is very different from one institution to another. You'll have institutions that in their IP policy, it says that the inventors will own the IP, not the institution. Oh, wow. So that's very different from the U.S. Yeah. There's also institutions that are like the U.S., the institution will own all the IP. And there is an institution like McGill that basically they, you know, it's co-owned. So 
when an IP gets created, it's owned not just by the inventors or the institution, it's co-owned by both of us at the same time. So clearly that will make a huge difference in how people report their matrix because just on the disclosure side, if, if it's inventor owned, you know, they may not disclose as much as if it was institution owned. Now, the other the other big difference in Canada is that because there are no Beidol, there are no registration, um, there is no requirement to, to offer to the government a non-exclusive uh, license on the IP and, you know, marching rights and all these things. So basically, what's possible here to do in Canada is that we can assign IP to a company. So we can assign ownership, not just license exclusively, we could actually assign. Of course, you know, this only happens when, you know, com companies are mature enough, when they have a clear business rationale uh, that we will switch from licensing to assignment, but it is something that we can do. So that's very different um, from the U.S., I would say. Yeah, that I would say so. That is really interesting as well. And, you know, this podcast right now is really timely because I know the 2022 Canadian licensing survey has just been released. And one of the new things about the survey this year and something that I found particularly interesting um, because I'm a patent attorney is that the questions about the number of licenses were subdivided into questions about patent licenses and questions about copyright licenses. Why was it important to track the differences between these two different types of licenses separately? And what did the results ultimately show? So I think it's it's early to tell, you know, exactly what this is showing, because not all institutions in Canada answered that question uh, correctly. Uh, not because they didn't want to. I think it, it's an important question. And it's a good question. But it, it's because, you know, the way you respond to the survey, you have to set some things up and we're not always set up to answer the question. So I think, you know, by looking at the data that we have this year, it, it was surprising to me to, to see that there's more copyright licenses than patent licenses in Canada. Now, this is mainly due to one institution that has a lot of them. Um, but, you know, it's still a big chunk of the licenses that we do that are not only for patents. So that was a surprise uh, to me and I think to others, too. But there's also the fact that there is other things besides copyright and patents. There's, you know, there seems to be a significant amount of other things. And that was this year when we look at the numbers, 9 percent, which is significant. So. At McGill, I know we've done licenses, uh, not just on patents or copyright. We, we did it on know-how, which is very tricky, very hard, but we've we've done it. And it's it's good to see when you look at, you know, the whole country that we're not the only ones and there's other people that have done other licenses. So I think that, you know, it's, it, it's important that we have this question. Um, at the annual meeting next year, uh, we'll, ha we'll meet with the Canadian, you know, institution and see how did, how did they like this question? How can they answer it better for next year so we could really get some you know, uh, trends going in the next few years. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it will be uh, fascinating to watch what the trends are in the future. So in addition to, you know, licenses and the types of licenses, what were some of the other key findings from the survey this year? So federal funding has dropped this year. So you can't really tell that it dropped. If you look at the total research expenditures, you could only tell if you compare the institution that responded last year with the ones that responded this year. And you could see there, there has been a significant drop. And this seems to have been filled by uh, industry, you know, making up for that drop. So industry funding has increased while federal funding has decreased. And this is really not a surprise to all of us Canadians because the federal government has decreased the more traditional operating research grants. And they favor now those more strategic funding initiatives. And often those are with industry. So I mean, I think this is how, you know, this could be explained. So this is one of the key things that we've seen this year. Um, the only disappointment was also that the invention disclosure is continuing to drop in 22. So this, again, can be due to the federal funding dropping. So that's another uh, key finding of this year. But on more of a positive note here, we noticed that staff is finally starting, you know, to, to rise. So uh, our offices are getting more staff, licensing staff and other staff. And this is really a, a, a clear uh, an indication in, in this survey of 2022. And then hopefully since we're getting more staff and, and, and again, restaffing our offices, you know, it will make a difference in the under matrix that went down a bit. 
So Olivia, I know it's human nature to want to compare ourselves to others. So I would imagine that many tech transfer professionals like to use the licensing survey data to see how their institution matches up against the top performers and against their peers. How valuable is it for tech transfer offices in Canada to have that kind of benchmarking tool? So I believe it's it's very valuable. It's necessary uh, in Canada because this, this survey captures most of what we do, most of the indicators in technology transfer. Now, I don't know that there is anything out there uh, that would that does the same thing, that has the same kind of indicators. I've seen, you know, websites of university that have that report some of their numbers, but nothing is in, in one document and nothing is as good as autumn in, in terms of, you know, amount of years it's been going on. So in this, in this autumn survey, you have like you can look at many years. You can't you know, not just this year, but, you know, if you want to look at you know how some institutions did you look at the past 10 years if they reported so that's like a, an amazing tool for us and it's it's really good to show our higher management our vpr you know and and show them how we did this year and how we compared to like maybe 5 years ago uh because it's all there it's it's all there you could find that in the stats database on the autumn site um and even for an office you know when you started small and you grew you could see how how what indicators really you know, changed with, with the growth and compared to other institutions in Canada that, you know, went through the same thing. So I think it's an amazing tool. It, it's really great. I think some people don't like responding because of they're scared of the revenues question. And it's honestly, it's not about the revenue. You know, there's so many other indicators that, you know, will show the economic impact that an institution does, like how many patents you filed, how many spin-offs you've started. So it's not just about the dollars and you shouldn't be scared not to answer just because you feel like you don't, you're not bringing enough revenue from licensing. Yeah. I think that goes back to the whole human nature about always comparing yourself to, to peers and, and some of the, um, the bigger institutions or the top performers. And I think sometimes people don't realize there is a lot of value in answering that survey and you just kind of have to really put that out of your mind. So Olivia, I wanted to ask you from your perspective, what role does a Canadian licensing survey play in influencing policy decisions or let's say guiding strategic directions for tech transfer on a national scale? And are there instances where the survey data has directly contributed to positive changes or maybe advancements in the field? So I would say that presently there's not much out there for Canadian policymakers to look at that would capture these types of indicators. So Autumn is really one of the only surveys that reports the main metrics that relate to what we do to technology transfer and intellectual property and innovation. Um, you know, it's the only place that you could find how many invention disclosures have happened, how many licenses, options, all in the same place, uh, all reported by year for many institutions. And, um, you know, if you take it as a whole, that's the place to go. But, you know, of course, you can find one or two indicators in different, you know, databases. If you look at the patent databases, you can look at how many patents were filed by institution. But, you know, to see it all in the same place, I think it's the only tool, you know, that people have uh, that they could they could look to see how the how the field is going, really. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you next was um, about using the licensing survey data to maybe correct mis perceptions about tech transfer. And it was interesting because I noticed that in the message from Almisha in the 2022 Canadian Licensing Survey, she talked about this. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. So yes, there was a recent report that was published in April, and we discussed it at the annual um, Canadian meeting, because uh, it was like a shock to us on, on the conclusions that were drawn from that report. And of course, they referred to some of the autumn data. We don't know exactly what data set they used. But when, you know, each individual from their office looked at the data and see if we could come up to the same conclusion, that's not the conclusion, you know, uh, that, that came from our results. So this basically was... Uh, it was based on the licensing to foreign or domestic companies. So, you know, of course, in the autumn data, there is the question and how many licenses did you do this year? And yeah, everyone has that. And so it's easy for us to go back at the data and say, OK, so from those licenses, how many were with Canadian companies and how many were with, you know, non-Canadian other? So everyone's doing that exercise. And the few of us that did it, 
they noticed that about 80% of, of the deals we do are with Canadian companies. And the report was more referring to an estimate of 40%. So that's completely different from 40 to 80 is a huge difference. So what we're doing now, there's a working group that's basically uh, looking exactly at how many licenses we've done with you know, Canadian companies, multinationals, and all that, just to be able, you know, to answer better and also to share that with the with whoever read also that report from April. And I'm thinking also that next year on the survey, we'll add that question for the Canadians, just so it's clear and it's all there in one document. Yeah, very interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens going forward with that question. So switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about collaboration because really that's the cornerstone of successful tech transfer. Olivia, how would you say the Canadian licensing survey reflects the collaborative nature of tech transfer activities in Canada? And are there any particular or maybe specific partnerships or collaborations that are highlighted in the survey results that you found particularly impactful? So I don't think it's that clear from the survey. I think we started tracking interinstitutional agreements, which is one way, you know, to monitor uh, collaborations. But this is like a new uh, a new indicator and we don't have many years on it. So we can't you know draw many conclusions from that. Uh, that being said, because of the more strategic focus research grants and programs that are ongoing now, uh, there may be an opportunity for us to see more of those collaborative, you know, uh, matrix. Now, you know, how to capture that? I think we, we may need, uh, you know, to add some questions. And one question that I was thinking is that when you... One way that it's easy, basically, for for people to respond, because it's not just like having, you know, an answer. It's also, you know, having it and being able to everyone in Canada being able to uh, respond to that question. So when we file patents, you could see if they're only assigned to um, one institution or to more. So we can ask the questions on the file on the new, uh, you know, uh, IP that was filed this year on the new patents that were filed. Uh, is there more than one? Uh, assignee. So that that could help also answer that question in future years. But it's, it's not something that we're doing yet, but we're planning to do next year. So technology is evolving rapidly and not surprisingly, so is tech transfer. So in what ways has the Canadian licensing survey adapted over the years to capture new trends and challenges in the industry? And how do you think it stays relevant in this ever changing landscape? Okay. So in my opinion, the survey presently captures the key indicators of what technology transfer offices do. Now, of course, we'd like, you know, uh, to capture more things and especially, you know, for industry and policymakers so they could see, you know, the impact of innovation more than just like how many patents we file, how many disclosures we get. But, you know, maybe some indicators that, you know, would show the impact. Now, as the field evolves, new indicators, you know, are added to the survey. Some are added this year, some will be added next year. And, and we are trying to adapt, but it's not just, you know, adding more questions. It has to be questions that people can answer. So the way it's done right now is that we add questions and we see like, you know, who can answer it? Was it answered? And if it, it's a question is added and answered many years, you know, you, you you could keep that question, but if, if no one can answer the question, then you can't really keep it. So I think that's that's our strategy. We'll we'll try to add some questions. We'll see who's able to answer, who's who's who can't answer, and if maybe we could tweak the question, discuss it at the annual meeting again to see, you know, what would be great questions to add that could be easily, you know, answered and that could tell us something. You know, it will never be like it's very hard to track. For example, how many jobs, how many jobs are created by intellectual property, by licensing to startups? I mean, very hard question. Uh, but one question could be like how many startups are able to get funding from investors? That's something that we could start tracking, you know, and that could show the economical impact that we don't really track right now. So, yeah, m a lot to do, uh, but it's a work in progress. And I guess and we'll see in future years, you know how we can best describe the impact of what we do. So Olivia, personally, how do you integrate the insights and data from the Canadian Licensing Survey into your day-to-day -day work at McGill's Tech Transfer Office? So we look at the, the survey to see how we've done that year, right? And I mean, I think every year we look on how many patents we filed, how much revenue we brought, how many spinoffs we did. So, you know, we look at it, our you know, higher management, the VPR asks, 
to see the data. Uh, they ask questions about the data. So this year, for example, we noticed that we really have a, a low revenue number. And that was surprising to our uh, VPR. Sure. And, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so, I mean, I was, so we reflected on this and what happened this year? Why do we have a, a low revenue? And we also noticed that, you know, we have a lot of spinoffs. So this is our interpretation is that, you know, since we have a, a, a lot of spinoffs and spinoffs, uh, m- many much more than other institutions. So it's possible that the spinoffs currently in the financial environment, uh, they have they are facing difficulties, you know, to raise funds and, and, and to push uh, the technology forward. So, of course, if we have a lot of deals with spinoffs, you know, our financials are not going to be great in the first year because it takes they don't have money to pay, you know, upfront of milestone payments in the short term. You know, it is possible to take many more years to actually make payments and to move the needle on the revenue uh, indicator for us. So um, my strategy is to try, you know, of course, we want to keep, you know, giving a great service to spinoffs, encouraging and doing more spinoffs and many spinoffs. But we could put in place some strategies to optimize the time we spent on the spinoffs to also have time to do deals with, you know, bigger companies that will have revenue that, you know, could come faster and, and then that would move our needle on the revenue um, indicator. So that, you know, we, we will adapt so that that is used to see, you know, what happened in the year and how can we make sure that, you know, if something went down, how can we up it again? So given your personal experience using the licensing survey, do you have any suggestions for individuals and institutions how they can effectively leverage the insights gained from the survey to enhance their own tech transfer efforts? I think you can, you know, when you look at the data, you see what happened, you know, uh, at your institution, but you may look at, you know, another institution that that has the comparable research expenditure as you or the uh, comparable staff and see if if they have the same trend. And then you can contact them and ask questions. So I think because you could see everyone's data, you are able then to, you know, if you had something go up and down and you want to optimize, you can go in and, and, and knock at the door and, and ask them. So I see that you, you had the same problem as us. You, you know, you filed less patents, for example, this year. Uh, what happened? Is this because you filed more strategically? So I think that that is good because, you know, it could tell, it could help you contact other institutions that may have the same kind of indicators as you in that year. So before we wrap up, Olivia, there's something quite extraordinary I'd love to touch on. I've learned that not only are you a driving force in tech transfer, but you also possess an incredible linguistic talent. You're fluent in four languages, and I have to say I have enough trouble just with English. So not only do you speak English, you speak French, Spanish, and Romanian. Uh, So your multilingual abilities truly stand out. How has your linguistic proudness influenced your work in tech transfer and your engagement with colleagues, partners, and collaborators from various backgrounds? So I want to start to say that English is really my third language. You're doing better than me. (laughs) (laughs) I was born in Romania. I came to Canada when I was four. So it was never by choice. I was forced to learn French because I was sent to French school all my life. So I learned French, fluent in French. And then for university, I was sent to McGill in English school. So I was forced to learn English. That's how I learned English. And, you know, of course, you know, it was not a choice. It was, you know, forced on me. And I believe that being fluent in all these languages, they do help on the technology knowledge transfer field, because there's a lot of network events, there's a lot of partnering events, and individuals, they tend to, you know, be more friendly, relate more, you know, discuss more, which you have conversation if you can talk to them and speak to them in their mother tongue, right? So, of course, here in Quebec, French is, 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 is there's a lot of French, especially, you know, in partnering events and network events. And, you know, people are surprised that I speak French because I work at McGill and a lot of people at McGill don't speak French sometimes. So, you know, it's, it's a plus for in tech transfer. It's a plus in Quebec for sure to you know, speak French, but even like Romanian, I've met a lot of uh, VCs. I have met a lot of CEOs that were Romanian and then and it was easier to talk to them and they were more interested in talking to me because we could speak in Romanian. So I think it did help, you know, of course, you know, uh, Spanish, 
I don't use it very much. I mean, this is something I acquired when I was a teenager. But I think in the U.S. there are a lot of Spanish um, individuals, and I, you know, we can go at conferences. I could easily understand what they're saying, and and I think it's easier to relate. So thank you so much, Olivia, for sharing all these insights on the 2022 Canadian Licensing Survey. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been uh, fun. Thank you for joining us on this enlightening episode. I hope this episode has shed light on the incredible work being done in Canada's tech transfer landscape and the pivotal role that the Canadian Licensing Survey plays in catalyzing progress. Be sure to check out the results of the 2022 U.S. and Canadian licensing surveys yourself, which are available for purchase through the Autumn website. Thanks for listening to Autumn on the Air with Lisa Mueller. Get social with us and share your thoughts. You can tweet us at AUTM or visit us online at AUTM.net. We'll be back next week on the air. Be sure to join us. 